to listen. You know it's going to be a bad day when the birds are singing outside your bedroom window in the morning, you look out there and they're all buzzards. Right? You know it's going to be a bad day when you turn on the morning news and they're all displaying emergency routes outside of the city. Amen? You know it's going to be a bad day when your boss says, don't bother taking your jacket off this morning. That's not funny, guys. You know it's going to be a bad day when you wake up in the morning and your dentures are locked together. I know some of you here get that one. All right, I, I see some laughing out there. Okay, here's my favorite. You know it's going to be a bad day when your horn gets stuck while you're following a large group of hell's angels down the highway. <laughs> How's that one? That's a good one, huh? So, you know, even though we love Jesus, even though we have freedom, we're still going to have bad days, aren't we? We're still going to have uh, discouragement that's going to try and come into our life, Right? Anybody remember what we preached about last week, Sunday? Somebody in this place has to remember. The power of the gospel, amen? About going out and, and preaching the kingdom and healing the sick and, and um, raising the dead and, and uh, casting out devils and cleansing the lepers, right? When we do that, we, we, we see the kingdom of God come to us. We see more and more of that freedom. But even when, we, when we're demonstrating the power of the gospel, we're still going to have discouragement and we're still going to have bad days. Can I get an amen? Okay, the Apostle Paul, you know, one of the greatest Christians of all time in, in my eyes, you know, and there's many great ones, but, you know, he, he wrote half of the epistles from jail. He was shipwrecked, bit by snakes. You know, he had the power of the gospel in him, but he depended on the Philippians to pray for him. He knew that people were praying for him. He had the power of the gospel moving in him, but he still had these bad days, you know. So I'd rather be stuck with the, with the hell's angels than be behind bars preaching for the rest of my life. But if I had to do that too, I guess I'd be happy, amen? Because the one thing is I know Jesus and I know where I'm going to spend eternity, right? Okay, so here's what I know about discouragement. Is there anybody here that's ever been discouraged before or am I the only one? So, so discouraged sometimes. And some of you are probably saying, well, it depends on whether it's morning or afternoon because it could be, right? So Jesus said in John 16, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And we have Jesus in us, right? We're going to have trouble. He had trouble when he walked here. We're going to have that trouble, but in, with him, in, we have the peace of Jesus, amen? He has overcome the world, so we have overcome the world. Can I get an amen? You got to work with me out here tonight. I want to hear lots of amens because we're encouraging one another. We're encouraging the folks online and we're going to boot discouragement. We're going to boot the devil out of here at least for a few minutes. All right? Amen. Number two, the second thing I know is discouragement is contagious. It is contagious. How many have been discouraged by somebody else that was discouraged? Yeah, yeah. How many have caused somebody else to be discouraged when you were discouraged? Amen? Yeah. Someone once said that people can be a double-edged sword. Sword. One side is encouragement and the other side is discouragement. And as a business person, I know that, you know, my greatest assets are people. Our greatest assets are people. Um, they can also be our largest liabilities, huh? Depending on how they handle discouragement in their lives. Number three, the third thing I know is there are successful ways to deal with discouragement. God loves to flip the script in our lives. Despite the script that we write for ourselves. Now sometimes we write a script for ourselves that might bring that discouragement into our lives. Is there anybody out there that's ever done that besides me? 
Amen. Many people have turned their biggest setbacks into their greatest comebacks. And I love that. I love when God takes the biggest setbacks and makes it the biggest comebacks. We just experienced that with the orphanage in Africa, in Uganda, and, and many of you had the opportunity to, to, to purchase desks or to give towards desks. And in the last two weeks, we've had people give towards the desks, toward the bunk beds, um, towards the mattresses. We're furnishing that place out, and it's going to serve God in an awesome way, and it's going to help a lot of children in Uganda. Matter of fact, it's going to help a whole village because we're going to build a church there. But the enemy tried to destroy that vision. And, and it seemed like that he was going to get away with it. But, 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 you know, we didn't give up hope. And God flipped the script. He changed it all around. And he brought that right back into the hands of TWC with Jerry's help in Scotland. And we just give God glory for that. And he loves to do that in our lives, too. And he'll do it every day if we let him. Amen. We got to let him, let him. It says in Isaiah 40, 31, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. And you guys ought to be able to say this with me because this is a scripture that you should be reading a lot. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not what? Grow weary. They will walk and what? Not faint. Amen. Amen. So let's take a look at Elijah. The prophet of Israel. Who knows about Elijah? Anybody in this room? Some of you might not have heard of Elijah before. I didn't see a whole lot of hands. Who knows about Elijah in here? All right, so Elijah was one of the, one of the greatest prophets of, of Israel of old. He was actually one of, one of my favorites. And he actually took uh, the prophet Elisha, Elisha under his mantle. And Elisha performed all kinds of miracles, and so did Elijah. You know, Elijah did great things. And who's heard of Ahab and Jezebel? Anybody? Okay, yeah, Jezebel's a, a kind of a common name because my grandmother, you know, even though she didn't know what Jezebel was in the Bible, she used to call, you know, some people the Jezebels, right? <laughs> but but uh, Ahab and Jezebel were like the two worst kings in Israel about the time of, of Elijah's uh, reign as a prophet. I shouldn't call it reign, but his time as a prophet, okay? And he, he was the voice piece for God during that time. But Ahab and Jezebel were the kings over Israel at that time, and they were really bad kings, you see, Israel went from good kings where they were serving the Lord to bad kings when they stopped serving the Lord and they started to, to serve idols and things like that. So they had other prophets of, like Baal, okay, Asherah. Those are two, two gods that they would serve, okay. They'd stop serving Jehovah and start to serve those guys, right. It's kind of like our country now where, you know, we, we've, been on, we've been hot and cold for Jesus for a long time. And here we are, you know, we're, we're starting to feel this hot come on, but we still see all that cold out there. We see our country serving idols and, and serving other things and not serving God. And, and we're starting to stand up like Elijah did, okay. And Elijah said, I'll tell you what, Ahab, you meet me at Mount Carmel. Okay, and you bring me all your prophets. And you, you, he brought 450 prophets, and he said, I'll challenge you. And he was all by himself. Elijah was alone, and he challenged these guys to a duel. Okay, and, and, and they brought all these prophets and all these spectators, all these people that used to serve God, but now they were serving Baal, you know, and they're all standing around like a sporting event. And he said, I'll tell you what, you build your altar over there, you put your sacrifice in there, and I'll build mine over here. You call your God down and have him consume that sacrifice up and burn that sacrifice up. So they did that. Those prophets, 450 of them, they, they dug their trench, they cut up their, their calf, they, they, they put the wood underneath it, but they weren't allowed to start a fire. Okay, they cut it up, and they got it ready. They started praying to their God, started praying to Baal, 
And, and nothing happened, nothing happened. They pray and the sweat's running down, nothing happened. They prayed for four hours, and then they, they decided, well, we're going to sacrifice. They started cutting themselves, you know, trying to get the, the attention of their God. And they prayed and prayed and prayed, and nothing happened. Their, their, their sacrifice sat there, and, and he said, you know what? He, Elijah, he just, he just picked on him. He said, your God, he must be sleeping. Maybe he's taking a nap. Maybe he's up there reading a book. Who knows? But your God is not God. He cannot consume that. He said, now I'll tell you what. He said, you take your people over there, and you get some water, and you dump it all over mine. He cut his up, and, 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 and they went over and dumped water on there. He said, no, no, you go get another load of water and dump it up on there. And they did that. And the third time, he said, you go over, dump all that water on there. Soak it down. Elijah prayed. And the fire God came down and started that on fire and consumed every bit of that offering. Elijah beat 450 prophets of Baal. Could you imagine that? Woo! Imagine that, how excited he must have been. You know, he had the faith to step out and do that. The very next day, Jezebel wrote him a letter. Said, I'm going to cut your head off. I'm going to have your head. Elijah freaked out. Elijah got discouraged. So let's take a lesson from Elijah. You see, let's examine why. First of all, Elijah was exhausted. Okay? Maybe some of you guys can take this and apply it to your own lives now. Okay? So you can learn about discouragement and learn how to beat it and defeat it. Amen? Amen. When we're tired, we set ourselves up. When we're tired, who gets cranky? Anybody here get cranky? Okay, Tammy, get both of them up there. Hi. All right, there you go. You got it. Jeremy, you don't get cranky? Oh, come on, folks. We don't have a lot in the tank. We're on a reserve, you know. A lot of times, I remember when I was a kid, I'd run out of gas. I'd have to flip that reserve on, but I knew I didn't have much left, and I better start heading home. Otherwise, I wasn't going to get there. And anything that happens starts to hit that reserve and it starts to drain us. Amen? The one thing that we need to do when that happens is we have to replenish ourselves. We have to replenish our spirit. When we become tired, when we become exhausted, we have to recognize it and we have to replenish our our spirit. Amen? The second thing is Elijah was naive. You know, he just won this huge battle, man. He was higher than high. He was, he was like a, you know, he was just happy and, 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 he, and he was naive about it. Because, you know, it doesn't matter. There's still evil. Until Jesus comes back, there's still going to be bad and evil. And just like Pastor David said, and it's not just an X on my back, but there is an X painted on our back. The devil does not want the children of God to be successful. The devil does not want revival. The devil wants to shut us up, he wants to discourage us, and he wants to frustrate us. And he'll do it however he can, amen? We, we got an X on our back. He thought all his problems would be solved when he defeated Baal, but it wasn't. The truth is, you know, there's still plenty of good and bad out there, but the bad will always rise up in our lives. You know, I'm going to embarrass my wife. There's a song out there, and it goes like this. Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam, where the deer and the antelope play, where seldom is heard a discouraging word, and the skies are not cloudy all day. It ain't like that, folks. (laughs) It ain't like that, man. You never know what you're going to wake up to when you get up, go down and get your coffee. You know, you just don't know what's going to happen. And we need to be prepared. Are you shushing me? Oh. (laughs) It isn't like that. So we, we cannot be naive. Okay, we have to have those spiritual antennas. Forgive me for saying it like that. 
We have to have our spirit in tune with God's. We have to have our spirit in tune with what's happening around us in our surroundings. And when we start to recognize things, we need to, or when we start to feel things, we need to recognize where it's coming from and what it is so that we can defeat it. The third thing is he was avoiding responsibility. Jezebel wanted his head and he ran. He just knocked out 450 prophets. And this one lady, this one lady scared him. He was frustrated and he avoided the responsibility. He wasn't made to run. God didn't make him to run. God made him a stand. God made him to stand and be a mouthpiece of God, but he ran, okay? Have you ever avoided God in his will in your life? Have you ever done that? It doesn't usually work out really good, does it? The next thing he did is he withdrew and pulled away. He went a day's will uh, journey into the Bible calls it the wilderness, and that's exactly where he was. He was in the wilderness. He pulled back from everybody. He was paranoid. He was disappointed. Can anybody in the room feel him? Yeah, at least a couple of you can be honest. It happens, man. You, get, you start to get paranoid, you dis, dis, distress, distressed, uh, depressed, and discouraged. You know, you think the world's out to get you. They are. They're out to get me, man. The state's out to get me. That's all there is to it. It's just me. It's just me. I got that. At, no, I'm just. <laughs> See, the next thing he did is he began to have faulty thinking. Faulty thinking. Okay? Step by step. Can you see the process? Step by step by step. We may look at other people who aren't discouraged. I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. He requested to God that he might die. The dude just won a battle the day before. He defeated a whole army all by himself and God. And, and now he's asking God, God, God to just take him and kill him. Don't be weary in your well-doing. Don't quit. Don't get tired of it. Don't let negativity corrupt your thinking. Negativity will do exactly that. It will corrupt your thinking. And that's what happened to Elijah. He sat down and he started to blow this whole thing out of, out of, out of uh, context. You know, and so this thinking come on. And then he had faulty comparison. You know, he was looking at the other people. You know, Jezebel, okay, you know, he beat Baal, but Jezebel's still there. She's still queen, and now all the people are after me. You know, so all of a sudden, his self-image is getting lower. Or we see, we see other people that might not be discouraged. We don't see that discouragement. We've, we're going through a little ourselves, and we see people that are on top of their game. So we start to compare ourselves to them, and, and we start to, you know, almost belittle ourselves. Our self-esteem starts to go down. That's not what God has planned for you, amen? That isn't what he has planned. We cannot consistently live in a matter that is inconsistent with the way we see ourselves. We have to see ourselves the way God sees us. You know, sometimes I think when we don't see ourselves the way God sees us because it says we're made in his image, are we depleting God? You know, he's saying, man, I, I made you just like me. I, you got me in you. But here you are. You think you're about this tall. Stand tall. This is how tall you are. Okay, this is where I made you. This is what you're supposed to be. You're not supposed to be running to the wilderness. You're not supposed to be down there. I made you to be great. Don't compare yourselves to others. Amen. The next thing we do, and, and you know, Pastor Christina prayed this today, is, is he lost his, his creativity. Our creative spirit goes first when we become discouraged. Elijah didn't know what to do, so he ran to a cave. He went to a cave because he didn't have any creative thoughts about what to do next. Amen? And God said, what are you doing here, Elijah? I didn't make you to live in a cave. You're my prophet. You're my prophet to this land. I want you to go speak the word to these people. I just gave you a victory, and here you are in a cave. He put himself there. Can you see the steps? Okay, remember the steps. And remember when they start to, when you start to see these things in your own life, grab them. 
grab hold of them and say, no, not today, Satan. Okay, we're going to talk about what to do when you see, but we're just talking about Elijah now. The next thing he did is he exaggerated the negative. God, I'm the only one. I'm the only one left, God. It's just me. It's just me. You left me here all by myself, God. How can I overcome when, when this whole nation is coming after me? How can I overcome this Jezebel? He thought it was worse than it was. He exaggerated to himself. Then he went into self-pity. The end result of discouragement is usually self-pity. Pity is one of the noblest emotions available to human beings. Self-pity is possibly the lowest of all. Okay? Now, there's a difference between pity and self-pity. Pity is the capacity to enter into the pain of another in order to do something about it. Self-pity is a crippling emotional disease that severely distorts our perception of reality. Pity discovers the need in others for love and healing and then creates speech and actions that bring strength and encouragement. Self-pity reduces the universe, listen, self-pity reduces the universe to a personal wound that is displayed as proof of significance. A lot of people wear badges of self-pity on their chests, okay? That's their badge of honor. That's how bad self-pity can grip a person. Pity is adrenaline, hey, listen to this one. Pity is adrenaline for acts of mercy, Self-pity is a narcotic that leaves its addicts wasted and derelict. Self-pity will destroy you, okay? And if you let discouragement go too far, you'll start to wander into that area of self-pity, and it'll only get worse and worse and worse, and pretty, pretty soon you're on a slippery slope. And God didn't create you for self-pity. He didn't. God encouraged Elijah. He said, get up. Refresh yourself and get up. He said, look up. Look to the vision that I gave you. I've been giving you vision your whole life. You've walked it out in all of your ministry. And now get up, look up, and then link up. You know, he said, go get around some people that are going to encourage you. He said, go to this person and go to this person. And then he went to Elisha. And that's right where he went was Elisha. And, and he created the, uh, uh, this, the relationship with Elisha that changed the nation. It changed things for, the, for, for a big time, you know, big time. Yeah, it changed a big time. But that's what it did when he finally got up. So how do we effectively deal with discouragement? It says in Psalms 31, 24, be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Now, I can tell you what, all you that are dealing with discouragement, and a lot of people might have tuned in to, to try and get something about, okay, how am I going to deal with this discouragement and depression and whatever? And I could sit here and read Scripture all day, but you got to get that Scripture inside you. That Scripture is really what's going to work and do it because everything that we're going to do to, to, to deal with discouragement is going to come from Scripture. I'm going to give you some practical things that you can think about and do, but it's going to come from Scripture. Its roots are going to be in Scripture. Amen. It says in Psalms 55, 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Are you righteous? Are you righteous out there tonight? Come on. Amen. All right. We give you praise, God. So what do we do? First thing is we have to get the right perspective. It's almost always a perspective issue, okay? You have to see the whole picture. If you start to get discouraged, step back. Step back and see the whole picture. Look at the whole picture. Discouraged people only see the negative parts. If you're only going to look for the negative, then you're going to remain in that spirit of discouragement. 
It'll always frustrate you. It'll always come after you. When we learn how to boot that spirit out, when we learn how to deal with that spirit, then it isn't going to come back. Amen? That spirit will get tired, depressed, and discouraged and go somewhere else. Amen? So what I need is a blessing that is not in disguise. That's what a lot of people say. I need a blessing that isn't in disguise because I can't see the blessings when they come. You know, you have to look for the blessings. You know, I, there's, a, there's a, a story about this kid that, you know, he's in his first baseball game ever. He's out in left field. He wasn't a very good player. He was probably the worst player on the team. And they were out, they were out on the defense in the field. And the, and the batters were up on the other team, and they came up, and they scored 17 runs in the first inning. I mean, they were belting the ball out of the park, just running the bases. And, and the other team, the kids are throwing their gloves down. They're all upset. And these are all good players. And, and the little kid out in, out in right field, he says, what are you all upset about? We haven't even batted yet. You know? And that's the way it is in the world. We see, we see this, all these things going on around us, but we haven't even taken our place at the plate yet. We haven't even been up to bat yet. We could go up there and start hitting home runs just like they did. Amen? Amen. Take a short look at the problem. Take an inward look at yourself and say, is this, is what, is this what I want? Because many a times when all we see is the problem and all we see is the negative, then then we just start to, we start to continue to, to live there, okay? Like, like I said earlier, it becomes our badge of honor. It's where we're at. Sometimes we take pride in our discouragement. No, no, it's not like that. That's not what you want. See Jesus as Jesus sees you. Amen? Sportscaster Harry Callis once introduced Philadelphia Phillies outfielder Gary Maddox. Anybody remember Gary Maddox? I do. Yeah. With the following words. He's, he gets, Gary's coming to the plate. Gary's turned his life around. He used to be depressed and miserable. Now he's miserable and depressed. <laughs> your future is bright, people. Okay? When, you, when I say turn your life around, when God says turn your life around, he doesn't mean like that for Gary Maddox. He means your future is bright. I made you to be great. I know every hair on your head. Okay? I can count every hair on your head. If I can count every hair on your head, do you think I want you living in discouragement? Do you think that's where you were created to be? No, you were created to be something great. I gave you that greatness. It might not be what this greatness over here, that greatness is, but you were created to be great. Amen. It's never too late for something great. Right, Donnie? It's never too late for something great. I don't care how old you are in this place or how young you are. It's never too late for something great. Colonel Sanders made a list of all that he could do. You know why? Because he was, he was 65 years old and sitting on his porch waiting for a Social Security check. Colonel Sanders. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was retired, living paycheck to paycheck, and, and they made a list. What, you know, do I want to sit here like, no, he made a list. And he said, what am I good at? Well, my mom was good at chicken, and she left me a recipe. <laughs> you know, and look what it did. You know, he decided, he decided to change his situation, and he decided to, to go after what God had ultimately called him to do. C Colonel Sanders, you know, everybody loves Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? He knew chicken. So <laughs> take a look at men of God who have lasted Persistent effort is always one of the most important ingredients with those men. A lot of those men were chased around on the battlefield. A lot of those men were chased by, by the enemy, by the devil. A lot of those men were chased by, by bad people, okay? But they were persistent. They were persistent in pursuing God. They were persistent in overcoming their failures. But they were persistent in helping others too. Success is won by people who overcome incredible obstacles and great discouragement. If you don't have obstacles and discouragement,
then it's not going to push you to greatness. I'm telling you, I'm here to tell you right now, I've witnessed it. Some are born with that spoon in their mouth, that silver spoon, okay, but they still walk through some of the same frustrations and discouragements. If you're going to be successful, you're going to have those. They have to be your vaulting board. They keep on keeping on. It says in Mark 10, 20 says, 27, Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Amen. Everybody experiences discouragement, but never, 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 never give up. Embrace perseverance. Okay, make that your word. If you have, if you have to describe yourself, in a month from now, make that your word, perseverance, amen? Perseverance. That's what we have to have as the church these days. That's what we have to have as a people, as a parent, as, as a teacher, as a worker. We have to have perseverance. The devil wants, to, wants us to give up on perseverance. The devil wants us to give up on our country. The devil wants us to give up on our rights as Christians. The devil wants us to give on, up on everything. If we don't have perseverance, folks, we'll give up. Okay, and it doesn't just happen here at the church. You're not going to be, you're not going to have perseverance in your spiritual life if you're not going to have it in your natural life. You better have it everywhere you go. You better walk with perseverance. So if I could describe you a month ago, I hope that would be a word that I can use to describe you. Amen? Amen. Okay, so here's a light thing. Two, fo two frogs, I'm going to see if I can say this without without blowing the words, okay? If I get through this without messing up once, I deserve a huge applaud, okay? Because you all know me, all right? I goof up a lot. Two frogs fell into a can of cream, or so I've heard it told. The sides of the can were shiny and steep. The cream was deep and cold. Oh, what's the use, said number one. Tis fate, no helps around. Goodbye, my friend. Goodbye, sad world. And weeping still, he drowned. But number two of sterner stuff, dog paddled in surprise, the while he wiped his creamy face and dried his creamy eyes. I'll swim a while, at least, he said, or so it has been said. It really wouldn't help the world if one more frog was dead. An hour or two he kicked and swam, not once he stopped to mutter, but kicked and swam and swam and kicked, then hopped out via butter. The frog didn't give up. He persevered, and he stirred that cream up, and he made butter, and he stepped right out of that can because he made butter. That other frog gave up. Man, here we are preaching about frogs, and we're not even talking about Moses. <laughs> Romans 15, 4 says, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. I'm trying to say it like a poem now. <laughs> So that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scripture, we might have hope. Amen? So take a big look at the possibilities. Get the best from the worst. Make your setbacks your comebacks. Declare them to be your comebacks. Okay? You know, I heard a story about this guy back in the day, you know, he sold life insurance and he came up on this guy and this businessman and he was selling this million dollar life insurance policy and that was huge, man. That was huge back in the day. And he got the guy, he got the guy to sign and he pulled out his pen. The guy had the paper, he pulled out it, he handed him his pen and the pen went dry. And the guy said, you know what? I need to think about this. I don't want to sign right now. He had his pen on the paper. Okay, that salesman walked away discouraged, but you know what he did? He went and created the fountain pen. That's the guy that created the fountain pen, okay? That pen went dry, so he said, I'm going to make a pen that will never go dry. <laughs> Amen? 52% of CEO, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies are from the lower middle class or poor families. Did you hear that? Over 50% of CEOs in the Fortune 500 came from lower-class families. They persevered. 
okay? They looked at possi possibilities. They didn't see the bad. They didn't accept the bad. They didn't accept the, the walls. They said, I'm going to go through the walls, okay? The, I'm, I'm going to make every setback. I'm going to learn from it. I'm going to make it a comeback. Amen? Amen? Here you go. When you're discouraged, see the right people. Don't see the wrong people. Okay? Don't go on Facebook and tell your story. You're just, you're putting an X on your back. Okay? Every naysayer, every negative person is going to come after you. They're going to come after you, and all you're going to see is negativity. And you're going to go down, 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 and it isn't going to be at the altar. Okay? Don't do that. The first thing I did yesterday is I went to three praying ladies and said, hey, pray for me today, will you? Okay, that's the first thing I did. Today, you heard Pastor David talking about it. Today, you know, I was blessed. I, I, got, I got ministry from, from people that spoke good things into me. I didn't go to the negative. I was there because of the negative. I was in my discouraged moment yesterday because of the negativity that was around me. All right? So what did I do? I went and found me some positive. Amen? A word of encouragement during a failure is more than an hour of praise after a success. Did you get that? Okay. A word of encouragement, encouragement during a failure is worth more than an hour of praise after success. Mark Twain said that he could live for two months on one good compliment. Right? Amen. John Maxwell said this, I want not only to see the right person when I'm discouraged, but I want to be the right person when someone else is discouraged. Amen. Remember, everyone that we come in contact with is fighting some battle in their lives, especially these days, you know. This isn't Little House on the Prairie. It's not the deer and the antelope aren't running around here. We got a bunch of little devils running around here, right? A bunch of little politicians running around here, right? Let's face it, you know, let's, let's, let's compliment people, let's, let's, let's encourage people. Even when we're discouraged, we encourage people. That's how we encourage ourselves. Remember the power of words. Does anybody know who John Wooden is? John Wooden. He coached uh, the um, UCLA. Who said that? UCLA Bruins. They won like 36 championships in a row or something like that. He was one of the greatest, he was the greatest college basketball coach of all time, all right? And, and here's what he taught his players, you know. You know how players, this is how he got them to play as a team and how they got them strong. He said, and, and, and you'll see this today in the NBA, but you'll see it in different ways because these guys today, they're a bunch of show-offs, okay? It's all about them anyways. But John Wooden taught all of his players, man, when somebody makes a good play, if you're coming down to court and I give you a good pass and you go up and slam dunk that ball, remember, it isn't all about that slam dunk. Somebody gave you a good pass. So when you start running back on that court, you give that guy a high five, you know, in the air like that, or you point at that fella. And, and they said to John Wooden, well, what if the guy ain't looking? And John Wooden said, don't you worry, he'll be looking. Are you shushing me? All right, Father, we just, we place, uh, we place Hudson in, in your hands, God. Lord, you've been with him since the beginning, God. You've been with him since he was, a, since he was born, before he was born, God. And, and he's been a testimony to your love for people, God. And we just place Hudson in, in your hands right now. Lord, we pray right now that you'll, you'll touch his body. Lord, you'll move through his body. You'll stir his parts, God. And, and Lord, you'll heal him in Jesus' name. You'll be with that family in Jesus' name. Lord, Lord, bring them peace and comfort right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 
Okay. Say the right word. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. That's Proverbs 18, 21. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things, okay? When we feel discouragement, go to the Word. Check the Word out and see what the Word says. Amen? Amen. Step back. Be, be, be conscious of what's happening. This is a battle, okay? Let, let your spirit rise up in you and be conscious of what is happening and take these steps one by one so you can battle this spirit of dic- discouragement because it has no place, okay? You can, you can battle through it. Yes, bad things are going to happen, but we'll get through them. Amen, Jim? Amen. Amen. Most of your discouragement is because you are listening to yourself rather than talking to yourself. Okay? Think about it. You woke up this morning and right away your mind is flooded with thoughts. Or maybe you're like me. Sometimes you wake up in the middle of the night and all these thoughts just come rushing in. Amen? They just come rushing in and they start to take over. You didn't invite them. No, you didn't invite those thoughts. They just come. That's, that's how it works. Those thoughts just come. You didn't invite them. You didn't ask for them. You aren't consciously producing them. You're not. They just come. They just come. They start talking to you. Am I the only one? <laughs> Listening to them is being passive, but speaking back at them is being active. Okay, so get active instead of remaining passive. Okay, speak to the thoughts. This too shall pass. Amen? This too shall pass. Do it anyway. Do it anyway. It's not what happens to me. It's what happens in me. Amen? Is there anything that you guys say to those thoughts when those thoughts come up? If there's not, start to think about what what is it that you want me to say to these thoughts, Lord, and write them down and start to use those thoughts. Those words, when these thoughts come after you, amen? Amen. Write them down. Be a cheerleader in your own life, all right? Be a cheerleader in your own life. You see, Jesus is cheering you on. The Holy Spirit is cheering you on. If you're not cheering yourself on, then you're leaving yourself exposed to that spirit. Let the Word cheer you on. Let heaven cheer you on. Let me cheer you on. Amen? I'll cheer you on. Words are both better and worse than your thoughts. Okay? They express them and they add to them. They give them power for good or evil. Your words give power to good or evil. To your thoughts. To your thoughts. To your thoughts. They start them on an endless flight for instruction, comfort, and blessing. Or for injury, sorrow, pain, and ruin. Amen? That's what they'll do. Make sure your words are positive. When you have negative thoughts, use positive words. Amen? Amen. Did you hear me? When you have negative thoughts, use positive words. You will drive those negative thoughts out. It's the same way with the enemy. When we we use God's word with the enemy, the enemy flees. Next. Next is make the right decision. Are any of you very tired at the end of the day? Okay. Yeah, I know. Yeah, of course. I scared the dickens out of you this night. She screamed loud. She scared me. It was blood curdling. I tried to scare her. She turned around and she... (laughs) You know why you might be tired? Maybe you're burning more calories than you think. Okay? Mental calories. Mental calories. See, here's a, look at, here's a look at how you burn mental calories, okay? Beating yourself up, 250 calories. Okay? When you deplete all your calories, you're going to be tired. Jumping to conclusions, 350 calories. Blaming others, 
195 calories. Dwelling on the negative, you're going to burn 200 calories. Okay, procrastinating, you're going to burn 135 calories. Okay, seeking revenge, 295 calories. Okay? You, what do you, she's saying, I'm just going to eat a couple brownies and I can get all the revenge I need. <laughs> daydreaming. Here, daydreaming's the biggest. God doesn't like daydreaming. 500 calories, man. Speaking negative, 400 calories you're going to burn. Okay? You know what else God doesn't like? Huh? I know, I know. Wishing, you know, wishing. God doesn't like wishing. God isn't a wishing well. If you wish too much, you burn 350 calories. So, so you know, who does all that in a day's time? I mean, you really got to eat a lot of food to keep up. Right? It takes too much energy to remain discouraged. I don't have that kind of energy left after doing all the good things that I need to do during a day's time. If I'm going to remain discouraged, I'm going to be too tired to do anything that's right. Amen? It's not easy to apologize. It's not easy to begin over. It's not easy to be unselfish, to take advice. Julia? <laughs> to admit area or error, Julia? To apologize. Let me say that one. To face criticism. It's not easy to avoid mistakes. It's not easy to keep trying. It's not easy to pro profit from your mistakes. It's not easy to endure success. Hey, it's not. It's tough, man. I, I used to, every time I get successful, I'd hit that self-destruct button. I think I preached about that before. You know, because we get, we get to a point where we're comfortable in our frustration, we're comfortable in our discouragement, we're comfortable in our failures, we're, we're comfortable being down here. And so what do we do when things go well? <laughs> Self-destruct. <laughs> Self-destruct. It's not easy to forgive and forget. <laughs> Thank you. It's not easy to think. Listen, it's not easy to think and then act. Right? It's not easy to subdue a bad temper. Is there anybody here that has a bad temper? Thanks, Donnie. I'll tell you something. If... If, um, thank you, Donnie. Appreciate it. It's, it's not, what's that? I'm sorry, what'd you say? I didn't hear you. You know, I used to have a bad temper. It's not easy to maintain a high standard. It's not easy to recognize a silver lining. But you know what? It always pays. It always pays, right? Discouraged people are prone to making poor decisions. Can I, can I get an amen on that? Okay. At least she doesn't have fruit. <laughs> Okay, discouraged people are prone to making poor decisions. Get this, folks, all right? We should make decisions on the peak and not the valley. Life is like this, okay? It is, all right? You know, the Holy Spirit tries to level things out and keep us on the, on the peak, on the mountaintop, but let's face it, life has peaks, 
and it has valleys. And sometimes you can go through peaks and valleys two, three times in a day's time. Okay? But, but here's why you, you don't want to make decisions when you're in the valley. You see more clearly on the peak. You get the whole perspective. Okay? When you're on the mountain, you can see. You're seeing things from the right perspective. When you're in the valley, you're not, you're, you're not, you don't have that perspective. Don't make decisions when you're in the, in the valley. When you, you're, you're running to something and not from something, okay? When you're on the peak, you're running to something and not from something. Sometimes when you're in the valley, we're running from something. Okay, and we're trying to run back up to that peak, but we're running from something because that's why we ended up in the valley. Okay, you leave everyone in a better position with a better opportunity when you make the right decisions because some of the decisions we're making are going to affect the people around us. Okay, so if we make them at the right time for the right reasons with the right perspective, then it's going to go better for everybody, right? You decide using positive data and not negative data. Don't ever make decisions based on negative data. Or emotion, amen, yes. Or emotion. I didn't, didn't just do a podcast or something or some, we were just talking about this. Use positive data to make your decisions, okay? When you make your decisions from the top, then you usually get to stay on the top, okay? Your decisions won't cause you to, to move to the valley or to stay in the valley. When life kicks you, let it kick you forward. If you're going to quit, quit when you're on the top. Right? If you're going to quit, quit when you're on the top. If you're going to leave something, leave it at its best. Leave it at its, at its best. Okay, if you're down in the dumps about something, if you, haven't, if you haven't done your best with that, if you're just leaving because of discouragement, don't do it. Leave it for the right reasons. Don't quit unless you're quitting from the top for the right reasons. Finally, do the right thing for the right reasons. You see the sign over there, our core values? That's the, that's the number one thing. Do the right thing for the right reasons. Amen. That's what we do as Christians, and that's when we get blessed with our decisions, when we do the right things for the right reasons. You know, a couple, a couple weeks ago, I preached about the runners. Remember that? The final leg of the relay race, the batons in your hands. Um, but, you know, sometimes... You might have that baton in your hand, and you feel, I got mine too, and you feel like you can't win. But you got to remember, okay, those runners feel the same thing. Those runners, when they're running that last leg, even, even the first, second, and third, they felt the same thing. They felt the pain in their legs. They, they felt the exhaustion in their lungs, okay? They were struggling with it. Okay, they probably thought about giving up. Have you ever been in a race and you were running? I don't know, maybe you haven't, but you, you just thought about giving up and stopping and just throwing the baton down. Okay, but most of the professional runners, what they do is they know they're going to get a second wind. They know a second wind's coming, and that's usually what happens when, when they start to get near the end, they all get a second wind, and you know, it's usually the guy that gets the best second wind and gets it the soonest, and he just starts to sprint for the finish line. But they get their second wind, and that's what you'll get, okay? When you're discouraged, you'll get the second wind. Look for it. Okay, do all the things we talked about tonight. You know, if you're discouraged and you struggle with discouragement, you should watch this thing again and get it in your spirit. You know, how God is showing you that you can overcome this discouragement. Maybe your discouragement is just temporary and you don't go through that a lot. Or maybe some of you struggle with it a lot. Okay, but God is here to push you to the finish line. He's given you all of the word. He's given you all of the tools. 
He's telling you you can do it. He's cheering for you, and, he, and you will get the wind you need to finish the race. Amen? Amen? God has a much bigger vision for you than your valley view. He's saying it's only a bend. He's saying rest in his presence, relax in his presence, go stronger in his presence. It says in Isaiah 55, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and I shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. It shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. He sent his word to give you life. He sent his word to give you victory. He sent his word to bring your family life. He sent his word to make you strong. Not to grow weary and faint, but he will give you the wind. He sent his word to encourage you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Stand with me, please. Just slip up your hands to Jesus. Pray with me. Father, we, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you care so dear, dearly for us, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you've called us winners, that we aren't losers. We thank you, God, that, that you're not a God that wants us frustrated. You're not a God that wants us discouraged. We thank you, God, that you're the God that sent the fire from heaven and you consumed the offering. Lord, we're offering ourselves to you right now. Not the way they did it, but we're offering ourselves to you to use us, Lord, to, to, to help us to become better so that, so that, God, we can walk in the calling that you have for us. You have a calling for us, and, God, we belong there. We belong there, and we recognize that. Lord, I pray right now over each and every person in this room and those online. I pray, God, that when we start to get a spirit inside of us that is going to cause discouragement in our lives and, and cause us to turn from you, I pray that you'll convict us however you see fit. I pray that you'll move in us and remind us, God, so that we can stay on the path you have for us. Lord, I know there's people here that struggle with discouragement. You told me that. Lord, I pray that you'll comfort them, you'll remind them, you'll lift them up, and you'll encourage them. And more than anything, Lord, I, I pray that you'll remind them about the house of God, about the people around them that love them and care for them and want to see them winning, want to see them in victory. Lord, I thank you for being with us tonight and spending this time with us. Lord, I pray for the rest of this week. I pray, God, that you'll, you'll move in this place mightily on Sunday. But until then, Lord, I declare you'll move through your people right here. You'll move through their lives. And, God, they'll go out of here preaching the gospel, sharing the power of the gospel, sharing their testimony. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. 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 Hallelujah.